Right, let's get started. How lovely to see you all. I'm John Nielsen. Um, I'm the treasurer of the foundation. I'm probably the 14th person that Gavin asked to chair this evening due to a slight absence of peers all voting in the House of Lords. Um, when I worked for Bayes and its predecessors for six years, I led the team who advised ministers uh, on uh, university research funding. And for then for the last nine years until very recently, I was secretary of Imperial College. And it's great for this event to welcome both everybody in the hall here at the Royal Society and many of you who are joining on Zoom as well. And we're particularly grateful to our sponsors for this evening, uh, the UKRI Trustworthy Autonomous Systems Hub. And you've got in front of you the title for this evening's event, Delivering the AI Strategy, the Use of New AI Technologies in Industry and the Public Sector. So last September, the government published the National AI Strategy, and part of this strategy is to support the transition to an AI-enabled economy. So particularly, the focus for this event is to look at how AI technologies are being deployed now in the public and private sectors and the expectations for greater use in coming years. So after we've heard each of our four speakers, we'll take questions both from the room here and from those online. So I now have to give some instructions about how all that works, um, for, especially for those on Zoom. Um, if you want to ask a question, please use the Q&A function on Zoom, not the chat function. And you click on the Q&A button, which may be at the bottom of your screen, depending on how your system works. Type in your question and press enter. You can do this at any time. There's no need to wait for the Q&A to start. And you can comment on other people's questions and importantly, upvote them. And so when we get to the Q&A, those with the most upvotes are most likely to get asked. Whether they'll be answered, we'll find out. Finally, if any of you want to tweet, please use the hashtag, um, uh, FST AI. Hopefully, it's uh, it'll be it's in your it's in your program here. Right. I think we're ready to start. Without any further ado, let's introduce our first speaker, Professor Dame Wendy Hall. So, Wendy is the Regis Professor of Computer Science, the Associate Vice President, International Engagement, and Executive Director of the Web Science Institute at the University of Southampton. Uh, she became a dame in the 2009 honours list. She's a fellow of the Royal Society, and she was, for this occasion, particularly important, co-chair of the government's AI review, published in October 2017. She's the first skills champion for AI in the UK. In May 2020, she was appointed chair of the Ada Lovelace Institute, and she joined BT Technologies Advisory Board in January 2021, 2021. So thank you, Wendy, if you'd like to start. Thanks, John. Well, it is great to be back. I originally said to Gavin I couldn't do tonight, but <laughs> when uh, the, we couldn't get the, uh, the Office for AI couldn't come and Tabitha couldn't come as chair of the AI Council. I think it's something called half term. Um, uh, I said I could do it online and then, and then he said, well, after dinner, which, you know, these events, the speakers have to stay relatively sober through dinner and then the questions get more aggressive because everyone else has had a lot of wine. And uh, he said he could offer audio interaction. I thought, oh God, I might as well. Here I am. And actually, it's a great pleasure to be back in this room, in the society. Um, my job is relatively easy tonight. I'm just going to take you through what is in the national strategy. And I'm really interested to hear what the other speakers have got to say about how we're going to implement it. Um, I am, um, as uh, John said, uh, um, well, here we are. This is, there's a picture of me here, and I think you might see this slide again. Um, I got involved in all this um, uh, in, in, the, in the policy side of AI. Uh, in 2017, when we were asked, Jerome and I were asked to write the review for the UK government, it was Theresa May at the time. Uh, and um, 
Uh, I am, so I'm, I'm now on the AI Council and I have the pleasure of being the AI skills champion, which just means they talk to me before they talk to anybody else about skills. But I won't know all the answers. I'm not in the office for AI and that's where the work is being done on implementation. But I can tell you what we all agreed should be in the strategy. Um, so the review I did in 2017 with Jerome um, became a part, a part of the industrial strategy. It was Greg Clark was the uh, uh, Bayes uh, Secretary of State at the time. Um, and uh, a sector deal, I had no idea what a sector deal was when we started out all this. But that's when you get the money from Treasury, basically. I also found out that when the government says they want to do something, that's when you start the hard work of talking to Treasury about how much money you want justifying the case and then you still have to when you've gone that and it's been approved you still have to get the check so you know these <laughs> i've learned a lot on this way that uh, um there's a as there's a long way to go even when something's been <laughs> technically approved so um that was the the, the first uh, i will talk, focus mostly on what what, what was announced last september um, as a council we've um, kept an eye on everything that was talked about in the first uh, in the sector deal um, and most of that money has been spent now and uh, we were asked or, um, to produce a roadmap for the next three five years which we published in January 21 and then the office for AI took that away and uh, working with us and others produced what was adopted as the national AI strategy uh, as John said last September and uh, that is still rolling out and you know as I said it's it takes a long time to actually get the money to do things and the office for ai is tiny it works across bays and dcms and it has to work you'll see in the slides both outward facing okay, industry universities the research sector and inward to government and how government uses ai um this is a sorry rather busy slide um but it basically captures in one slide what the ai strategy is recommending uh, we remain I made that I made them put remain rather than become because I think it's terribly important that people know we have been an AI superpower for a long time we're just not as big we don't you know we're never going to be able to scale up as, as US and China can but uh, we remain an AI and science superpower fit for the next decade not looking any further ahead than that it's all about as a let that first one has a bit of leveling up in it benefits of AI adoption across the region and sector maintaining our position, which is effectively third in the world. But for a country of our size, that is amazing. And it's because of our legacy. We have a fabulous, you know, we've been doing AI since it was called, before it was called AI. And, um, you know, we have all our top universities have very strong AI departments in and others as well, both broad and specialist. And we have a fabulous startup culture too which um, has, helps um, generate new companies um, and, and growth and, and wealth into the UK. Our problem is how do startups become big <laughs> and scale up in the UK? But we, uh, that's for everybody's problem, it's something that, that, that Britain's got to tackle uh, over the next few years. Um, so that's about maintaining that position as a global leader. And we, uh, we kept saying, if you take your foot off the accelerator, we'll just go backwards because every country in the world um, is trying to be good at AI and use it, whether they're going to develop it or just use it. And you look at the Canada's, the Japan's, the Australia's, every country, the big uh, science companies, countries in Europe. Um, and I've you know, missed a lot of countries out of that, um, but uh, wants to be big in this sector. Um, and we need to make it con contribute to growth of GDP um, we, there's a big piece in here about protecting our values and doing it in a way that's good for society, good for people, as well as good for business and um, uh, for government, uh, its government and, and its relationship with the citizen. And um, there's a strong piece in there too about um, how important it is for security, defence and security, uh, that we have strong capabilities in AI and our security agencies and so on. So um, the outcomes, I won't go through e each of them. I'm going to focus a bit later on, on diversity. We want, to, we want to be there developing groundbreaking stuff, and we want that to be applied in our industries, and we want government, public sector to use AI to its best advantage. Um, we want good public value for the money we're putting in. We want adoption across the country. 
um, and we want trust. We want to build an ethos of uh, people trusting AI systems. That's not easy, and we could maybe discuss that more uh, in the Q and A. So it's all about investing long term. You know, this is this cannot be something. The UK is terribly good at funding something for five years and then stopping and saying, "Well, you're off on your own now." Right? This has to be, and AI, forever in a sense. AI will, will will gradually get less sexy. Right? It will get as the things are coming along which will become more what's talked about, but this is going to be there forever. And um, as the systems get more and more intelligent, can do more and more things, we've got to keep an eye, a very close eye, on what that's doing to society and how, how it works in society. So ensure benefits across all sectors and regions and uh, governance of AI. So um, this, this strategy was all about government activity and what government needs to do in, in this, uh, the next 10 years. So just to take you through some of the examples of um, what's in the strategy, uh, Jerome and I, were very, we put data trust, that's the idea of um, knowing that you trust the data someone gives you, being able to share it with someone else, being a company being able to put their trust, I can hear the feedback, the company being able to um, trust in the data and, sh and share their data with other companies, lots of small companies said it's not a level playing field the people that have got lots of data are going to win. And so we, we put this as our top recommendation in the original review in 2017. Um, uh, there's been some, some fascinating pilot work done by the Open Data Institute and uh, with the Ada Lovelace Institute and the AI Council, I chaired a report on looking at legal mechanisms for data stewardship, which the Royal Society was involved because the chief exec of the Royal Society is, of course, a uh, lawyer by training. She took a great interest in this and there's lots more work to do. This is becoming a very, very hot topic, this whole issue. Um, then there's all about how you, um, and, and you know, data is sort of at the foundation of all, everything to do with the way we do AI at the moment, machine learning, deep learning. And there's adoption, driving adoption across different sectors. So the healthcare, um, uh, tech nation, uh, so smart startups, big science and uh, purchasing, right? How does AI help people make sensible purchasing decisions? For example, that's an example. That's a, another example of what they're doing. Lots of reports being produced. Uh, these are the areas that the um, Office for AI are working in with various partners. They're tiny, the Office for AI, compared to the challenge and um, uh, need to partner with other um, organizations to do the work they need to do. So there's a guide to using AI in the public sector, the guidelines for AI procurement, which I think, I can't read it here, but I think that was done with the World Economic Forum AI. Institute um, the ethics piece that do a lot with um, the Ada Institute and the Turing Institute on that. And there are a lot, there are a number of these um, good uh, places looking at ethics growing up and developing in the UK and explaining decisions made with AI. This is all about AI explainability, very important. Um, publishing guidelines, this is going to be really important. Best practice, how you do it. Um, so working with the Alan Turing Institute on ethics, as I said, algorithm, algorithmic decision making with the Center for Data Ethics and Innovation, uh, machine learning with DSTL, and there's a defense and security strategy on AI coming out. If it isn't, I might have missed it, but it's definitely on its way out at the moment. It's a very important sector. And um, more algorithms work there with the CMA. Um, it's really hard to pick international partners. Basically, the, the, uh, we're part of the GPA, the Global Partnership on AI, which is a way to get to most of the world except for China, another point of debate that will come up in the society soon. Gavin's planning a meeting on that I hear tonight, which is good. Um, this is led out of Canada and France, and we're a very big part of, of the working groups in this area, which gives us a, gives us a, a relatively easy way of um, part, you know, linking with a, a lot of different countries on this. We've, They've signed um, an agreement with to collaborate with the US and there are others of those bubbling up, but there's 
you know, it's really about resource and how much we can actually really commit to. One minute to go, my God. Um, okay, Turing Institute, UKRI. This is really important. We named, in the, in the first review, we named the Turing Institute as the National Institute for Data Science and AI, and UKRI, they are very important partners in this. And this is another thing. The UKRI is here, Robert, the Turing Institute. You know, this could be a world leader. It already is, and we need to make sure it is there in perpetuity. Um, Centres for doctoral training. Um, very important was fellowships for giving money to um, uh, uh, bring people into AI and fund them to do great work and stay in the UK, right? And not go to industry, not go. Um, Turing AI World Leading Fellowships. Here are the people we appointed, a fabulous set of people. Notice there are five of them. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. And I need to just get this, these points in, Gavin. So this is about, this is my, this time round, we're trying to do AI for every, at every level, not just at the higher education level. So um, uh, skills for everybody, boot camps, apprenticeships, work in schools. Um, how, do, how can anyone get in? wherever they are, whatever their context, whatever their background, get into this sort of work as a career. And uh, really exciting was that, and just after the AI strategy was produced, the chancellor said he picked two things out of the strategy, 2000 elite AI scholarships. This is for the, my favorite thing, which is the MSc conversion courses, which we launched as part of the first wave, which was about getting people from non-science subjects into AI. And they've been incredibly successful. He also wanted more AI world leading fellowships. And just this month, the 23 million pounds for the 2000 scholarships, the check has been signed. So that is happening. Um, it's been a game changer because 50% of those scholarships have to go to underrepresented groups. And in the first round, it was women, disabled and ethnic minority. And I think Gavin's telling me I want to finish, but that for me, is the, is the thing I want to promote the most. And we got, as I say, 23 million pounds announced to do more of these. Um, and my catchphrase, of course, is if, if it isn't diverse, it isn't ethical. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Wendy. Now, I think this is where we hope the technology works. Have we got our next? Uh, excellent. Our next speaker is Lord Clement Jones. Um, so Tim was appointed a peer in uh, 1998, and he is Liberal Democrat House of Lords spokesman for digital, uh, former chair of the House of Lords Select Committee on AI, co-chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on AI, founding member of the OECD Parliamentary Group on AI, consultant to the Council of Europe's Ad Hoc Committee on AI, and consultant to global law firm DLA Piper. He chairs Ombudsman Services, he chairs the Council of Queen Mary University London, and he's president of Ambitious About Autism. So Tim, we very much look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much, John, and I hope the uh, technology is working. It seems to be uh, so far, which is, uh, which is good news. Um, I uh, uh, am absolutely delighted to participate today. I'm just sorry, as a result of uh, self-isolation, not to be present in person, and particularly at the discussion later over dinner, because I'm already missing that glass of wine uh, with Wendy. Um, but I briefly want to talk about AI ethics and regulation and a bit about skills and digital literacy. And I'm just going to see if I can move on my slides uh, in the usual way. Uh, it's a great pleasure to follow Dame Wendy's uh, talk. And she talked about a journey. And a little over five years ago, we started work on the Lord's AI Select Committee inquiry that led to our first report in the uh, 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 AI in the UK, Ready, Willing and Able. And about the same time, uh, Wendy's Hall Percenti Review, growing the artificial intelligence industry in the UK, which really set a baseline. Uh, uh, and that was published around the, the same time. And I think Wendy uh, was one of our first witnesses. Now, of course, uh, uh, throughout, 
uh, that period, we've been faced with def definitional issues. And I think um, many of us have simply uh, uh, accepted the fact that there is always going to be something of an argument about how you define artificial intelligence. Um, and I think also uh, uh, that uh, 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 the right quality data is at the heart of AI applications too. And I think we keep needing to be reminded by that as uh, this cartoon does. Now, um, uh, since then, a great many institutions have played a very positive role in the development of AI policy in the UK. And this slide, courtesy of PwC, I think gives a pretty good picture of the uh, AI policy ecosystem. Now, some uh, of the uh, uh, institutions were newly established by government, some of them recommended by Wendy. Uh, we have the Center for De uh, Data Ethics and Innovation, the AI Council and the Office for AI. Uh, others are existing regulators such as uh, 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 the ICO, Ofcom, the Financial Conduct Authority and the CMA, uh, which have been getting together under a new digital regulators cooperation forum to pool expertise in this field. And I, I think that's extremely welcome. And of course, it will include uh, sandboxing. And our intellectual property office too, as well as the Court of Appeal, have been grappling with issues relating to IP created by AI. And as well as this, there have been some really excellent input from a variety of expert institutes on areas such as risk and impact assessment, audit, data trust mentioned by Wendy, uh, Wendy and standards such as uh, 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 and standards such as the Turing, the Open Data Institute, the Ada Lovelace Institute, uh, the British Standards Institute, and uh, the Oxford Internet Institute. So quite uh, a bunch of participants there. Now, uh, after publication of the National AI Strategy uh, last autumn, uh, now I think is a, a good time uh, uh, to, uh, oh, I'm sorry about this, I just want to go back. Uh, is a particularly good time to take stock of where we're heading on ethical regulation, especially as we await the AI governance white paper, uh, which we've been promised sometime around this spring. Now, we need to be clear above all, as organizations such as Tech UK are, in my view, that regulation is not necessarily the enemy of innovation. In fact, it can be the stimulus and can be the key to gaining and retaining public trust around AI and its adoption, so we can realize the benefits and minimize the risks. We've seen enough about how algorithms can get a bad name over the past few years, but as an optimist, I believe that AI will actually lead to potentially greater productivity and more efficient use of resources generally. But as Stephanie Hare's new book puts it in the title, technology is not neutral. We should be clear about the purpose and implications of new technology when we adopt it. Inevitably, there are major societal issues of where the benefit from new technology goes, as Professor Margaret Bowden expressed it very simply. Even if AI can do something, should it? Does it better connect and empower our citizens, improve working life? Questions to be answered, I think. And uh, uh, if any of you uh, were fans of uh, Jurassic Park, uh, you will have seen um, uh, that uh, 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 incorporated as well. I'm sorry, I seem to be having a few glitches with my slides here. There we go, there's Jurassic Park, uh, who faced exactly the same problem, uh, even if they could, should they? Um, so uh, uh, I believe in the UK, there is now a general recognition that we need to move forward with proposals for an ethics-based regulatory framework, and that this is what the AI governance white paper will contain. Uh, and I hope that it will take, um, you know, uh, good steps towards that. Um, some of the signs are good. Uh, the National AI Strategy accepts the fact that we need to prepare for AGI. Uh, and in the National Strategy too, they talk about public trust and the need for trustworthy AI. 
uh, government setting an example, the need for international standards, an ecosystem of AI assurance tools, and indeed the CDEI has developed a roadmap uh, towards delivering them. And they've published uh, 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 guidelines uh, on the application of AI in the public sector and on procurement mentioned by Wendy. Uh, and they've also established uh, a, a, an AI standards hub pilot led by the Turing and supported by the BSI and the National Physical Laboratory. And in fact, the government have also recently produced a set of transparency standards for AI in the public sector. And even GCHQ have produced a set of AI ethics uh, for their operations, which uh, I think is uh, is notable. On the other hand, on the other hand, uh, despite I think very little appetite in the business or the research communities, they're consulting on major changes to the GDPR post Brexit. In particular, the suggestion that we might get rid of Article 22 of the UK GDPR, the so-called right to explanation, where there is automated decision making. If anything, we need to extend this to decisions where there is already a human in the loop. There are no proposals to clarify data protection for behavioural or so-called inferred data, which are the bedrock of current social media business moral models, and will be even more important in uh, what has been described as the metaverse. And they also suggest that firms may not be required to have a DPO, a data protection officer, or undertake data protection impact assessments. And I would like to see much more progress on data trusts, uh, which Wendy mentioned as well. And most recently, after a year's work by the Council of Europe's ad hoc committee on uh, 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 AI, uh, on the elements of AI, um, uh, uh, at, at the very last minute, the UK government put in a reservation saying they couldn't yet support the document going to the uh, 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 Council of Europe because more gap analysis was needed, despite extensive work to that uh, to that effect in the feasibility study. And I think that was extremely uh, disappointing. And we've also no settled regulation or legal framework for intrusive AI technology, such as live facial recognition. And this continues to be deployed by the police, despite the best efforts of myself and a number of campaigning organizations, such as Liberty and Big Brother Watch, and even successive biometrics and surveillance camera commissioners who've argued for a, a, a full legal framework. Uh, 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 and we don't have, uh, uh, rust, a robust compliance or redress mechanisms for ensuring ethical, transparent, automated decision making in our public sector either, despite the guidance issued. Above all, it's not yet clear whether uh, the government is still wedded to sectoral regulation rather than horizontal. And I confess freely that when we wrote our original House of Lords report, it was not clear and we hedged on this. But I think the case is now irrefutable, especially in the light of the work in the UK on risk assessment and audit, that a risk-based form of horizontal regulation is required, which puts into practice the common ethical values we've all come to accept, such as uh, the OECD principles. Since then, however, there's been a great deal of work internationally by the Council of Europe, the OECD, UNESCO, the Global Partnership on AI, and especially the EU with its proposal for an AI Act. And so I hope that when the AI governance white paper does emerge, that there is a recognition that we need a considerable degree of convergence between ourselves, uh, the EU and members of the Council of Europe in particular for the benefit of our developers and cross-border businesses uh, to allow them to trade freely. Above all, uh, uh, this means uh, agreeing on common standards for risk and impact assessments alongside tools for audit and continuous monitoring for higher risk applications. And that way, I believe we can draw the US into the fold as well. And this, of course, is not even to mention the whole defense and lethal autonomous system space, the subject of Stuart Russell's second reef lecture, which despite the promise of a defense AI strategy is another and rather depressing story. As regards skills for the future, Wendy is the expert on AI skills and hugely and a hugely effective advocate. But I think the COVID pandemic has shown these issues in sharp relief. 
uh, AI is becoming embedded in everything we do and prompted by Wendy's original report and subsequently by the AI Council, as she said, there is a huge amount happening on AI specialist skills, Turing fellowships, PhDs, conversion courses, uh, uh, and of course our ability to attract and retain the top AI uh, research talent is of paramount importance and all credit uh, to Wendy and her colleagues uh, for uh, securing the backing from the Treasury uh, for all the initiatives that they have uh, uh, put into place. Uh, but as the roadmap produced by the AI Council itself points out, the government needs to take steps to ensure that the general digital skills and digital literacy of the UK are brought up to speed. And I don't believe that the adoption of AI is making or will necessarily make huge numbers of people redundant but as the pandemic recedes and our government has to address the economic impact of it, the nature of work will change and there will be a need for different jobs and skills. This will be complemented by opportunities for AI and the government and industry must be ready to ensure that training and retraining opportunities take account of this. And our own select committee absolutely shared the priority of the AI Council roadmap for diversity and inclusion in the AI workforce and wanted to see much more progress on this. But we need, however, to ensure that people have the opportunity to reskill and retrain, to be able to adapt to the evolving labor market caused by AI. The new skills for jobs paper and the uh, post-16 uh, uh, skills and post-16 education bill with its introduction of a lifelong loan entitlement is welcome, but isn't ambitious enough. And I. Uh, 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 but I do uh, uh, welcome the renewed emphasis on further education and the new institutes of technology. So what skills should we be actually nurturing for the future? Future.now, founded by former Lord Mayor Sir Peter Estlin, estimates that 90% of UK jobs within 20 years will require digital skills. But it's very clear that this isn't just about to get STEM skills, such as maths and coding, all tech developers uh, that I talk to agree that social and creative skills and critical thinking will be needed as well. Human skills, so the humanities will be as important as the sciences. And the top skills currently being sought by tech companies, as the University of Kingston's future league table have shown, do include many creative skills, problem solving, communication, critical thinking, and so on. Um, and I think we need to uh, keep that in mind. Careers, advice and adult education do need a total revamp as well. Apprentice levy reform is overdue and the work of local digital skills partnerships is welcome, but they're massively under-resourced. Broader digital literacy is crucial. We need to learn how to live and work alongside AI and a specific training scheme should be designed to support people to work alongside AI and automation and to be able to maximize its potential. And I very much like the recommendation of the AI Council's roadmap for an online academy for understanding AI and agree with their goal too about every child leaving school with a basic sense of how AI works. Finally, given the current and imminently greater disruption in the job market, we need to modernize employment rights to make them fit for the age of AI, uh, of the AI driven gig economy, in particular by establishing a new dependent contractor employment status, which fits between employment and self employment. But more of that anon. Thank you very much. Tim, thank you very much and very important points. So our third speaker is Professor Geraint Rees. He is Pro Provost Academic Planning, Pro Vice Provost Artificial Intelligence and Dean of Life Sciences at UCL. He is their strategic lead for AI, making UCL's AI activity greater than the sum of its parts and leads the development of UCL's AI for people and planet strategy. He's a director of UCL Business Technology Transfer Company and formerly was senior scientific advisor at DeepMind. So he's also been deeply involved in commercializing AI technologies. He shapes training of the next generation of AI healthcare expertise 
as co-director of the AI-enabled Healthcare Systems Centre for Doctoral Training at UCL. Do come up, thank you. So good evening. Like many of us, I usually start by saying what a great pleasure it is to be here. And of course it is. Um, but this evening, that phrase has particular resonance for me because it's the first time for me, maybe not for you, I, I imagine you've had several meetings before now, but it's the first time in a couple of years I've stood in a room with unfamiliar people to give a talk to physically present as well as those online attendees. And it's that simple but really profound pleasure that will animate my remarks about AI tonight. It's also why I've chosen not to use slides, because I think if I want you to take away one thing from my remarks, it's that I think delivering strategic advantage through the national AI strategy will depend on us thinking more about people than about the technology. So at the start of the pandemic, uh, we were told that AI would change the world, and I am confident it still will. But the pandemic has also brought with it some pretty profound realizations, I think, about the nature of our society and its relationship to technology that we're all still working through. I work at UCL, one of the world's great universities, there are others, and approaching its bicentenary. Before the pandemic, we were told that universities were places that were failing to adapt to modernity, that were hopelessly out of date, that would inevitably be pushed aside by the disruptive forces of technological innovation. Online learning platforms, were the future, particularly if you wanted to learn about machine learning. Now, two years into the pandemic, a rather different story has emerged, I think, both politically and socially. Despite the outstanding efforts of our staff and indeed staff across the UK in adapting to deliver over two years of teaching and learning online, students have given their verdict. They would like to return to face-to-face -face education and shared campus experiences, as would their parents, as would their lecturers, as would the university's minister. Advanced technology and innovative blended approaches will therefore remain part of their education. But the interesting thing is that students demand human interaction in our great seats of learning. And we're, of course, all here physically today, even though we could just be on Zoom. So I want to begin my remarks by reflecting on that revised version of the future. It was pretty obvious to all of us, I'm sure, before the pandemic, that artificial intelligence and associated technologies are a really important part of our shared future. It's also made visible the crucial importance of applied mathematics and computer science in addressing some of the consequences of our enforced isolation. But it's also made visible the limitations of our technology, and I don't just mean slides running amok. And um, while the collaborative tools that have enabled many of us to continue to be productive from home are amazing, it's equally important that all of us miss the social interaction and shared physical experiences, not just of our families, uh, but at our workplaces. So that's a reminder, a very visible reminder to me that technology comes into existence on a planet already populated by human societies, and indeed, I'm a life scientist, plants and animals. So that's the first observation I want to make, uh, that as the OECD say, AI should be for people and planet. UCL makes this the centerpiece of our AI strategy, trying to position AI as a force for good in the world through considering the human dimension, inclusion and diversity, all things I'm delighted that all previous speakers have highlighted. We're also interested in open science and the potential for misuse. And by having that kind of framework at the front of our minds, we want to position AI as a force for good. Now, my second observation is on the consequences of that blended future I've outlined for the sort of workforce we'll need. Um, and I would commend to you, as well as the excellent reports we've heard about, the 218 Royal Society and British Academy project on the future of work. So the browser and the computer screen are a deeply controlled, two-dimensional at present world in which to deliver machine learning and its benefits directly to individuals. And in such an environment, the answer to any question might well be, we need some more software engineers. Jolly good software engineers are too. But the sector-specific environments in which humans live and work are much messier and more uncontrolled. Mastering successful interactions in different sectors like that often requires tacit knowledge that's domain specific and an approach that is fundamentally humanistic. Think of going to your doctor or going to a hospital, for example. If the answer to that question is more software engineers, then we've not really properly understood the question. So to ensure that the benefits of AI are seen in every sector as the AI strategy demands will therefore depend on many disciplines. 
Echoing Tim's word on the skills agenda, I would say we need to recognize the central role of the arts and humanities in understanding and interpreting human experience. The social sciences in helping shape how AI might fruitfully interact with people and societies. What if Facebook had been designed by social scientists, for example? Such disciplines, in my view, are as important as computer science in shaping new AI technologies. Now, for particular applications of AI, we also need to combine domain-specific expertise and knowledge with technical expertise. For example, in the domain I know about, medical applications will clearly benefit from structured interaction between doctors, healthcare professionals, computer scientists, and software engineers. How we create those partnerships, though, is, I don't think, trivial and may merit some closer attention. So, for example, Domain-specific expertise possessed by healthcare professionals is often tacit and not articulated explicitly, but it can be crucial. For example, one project I've been involved in, the selection by Google DeepMind of acute kidney injury as the medical condition to identify through longitudinal time series analysis of healthcare data might seem a bit arbitrary, but it picks out what medical professionals know is one of the most common causes of unexpected deterioration in a patient's condition in a general hospital anywhere in the world. So it provides the algorithm with general applicability. And it came about not by chance, but because medical professionals work together with DeepMind in a systematic and structured way. So how do we bring together those kind of skills across different sector? I, I think that's two fundamental approaches. Either we train a single individual in both areas, or we bring together individuals with complementary skills. I would say both are domains in which universities and seats of further education excel. For example, in healthcare, we're used to training clinician scientists who straddle two worlds, two ways of thinking and doing, two sets of languages. But training clinician computer scientists, for example, is still in its infancy, and individuals with these skills are still pretty rare. Bringing together people with complementary skills is, is another approach, but it's not as simple as just putting people in the same room and hoping they get on with it. Universities, as well as other bodies, have increasingly deep experience at understanding how to create the conditions for that interdisciplinary dialogue between disciplines. There are many other examples at different levels of training. We need to do that for AI in applied domains for effective innovation to flourish. The alternative, of course, is to risk creating humans that work for AI rather than the other way around. And one area where I would highlight some warning signs in that regard is actually healthcare. If you look at the US, where rapid deployment of electronic healthcare record systems in the United States over the last decade has taken place, it hasn't unfortunately created a technological nirvana of elegant, unobtrusive, and effective capture of data from healthcare consultations. And actually, a much more challenging situation has emerged. And you might want to take a look at Atal Gawande's 2018 piece for The New Yorker entitled Why Doctors Hate Their Computers. Essentially, instead of making healthcare easier and effective, doctors, in his view, feel trapped behind their screens where physicians spend now about two hours doing computer work, data entry, for every hour spent face to face with a patient. The physician is required to conform to the requirements of computer data entry screens rather than focus on being a doctor. I suggest that should not be the future of AI. My third observation is about fairness and bias, which is uh, not only topics of enduring interest in human societies, but I'm delighted to say that both uh, speakers have already mentioned them. I find it a little surprising that the discipline of artificial intelligence has only recognized recently that this is a really significant problem. Machine learning systems trained on historical, and, and maybe it's not true. Uh, uh, for the purposes of debate, I, sh I shall entertain this idea. <laughs> machine learning systems trained on historical or incomplete data have duly learned to produce unfair results. Examples I'm sure many of you are familiar with include corporate HR tools prejudiced against women, uh, gender and dialect bias in automated captioning on a well-known uh, website, and image ta tagging software that miscategorizes people as animals. These are shocking examples, um, but they hide even deeper challenges as AI progresses to consider complex domains like healthcare. Fairness in healthcare, I think, is uniquely complex because both model performance and healthcare outcomes depend in part on an unknown combination of biological, environmental, and economic factors. And some level of different model performance, being a bit technical here, that varies across a group may be absolutely desirable. So, for example, if a particular ethnic group is more at risk from a particular disease, and I'm sure you can think of diseases like that that have just caused a global pandemic. 
Unlike the earlier examples, a major problem affecting that sort of machine learning is the absence in many, perhaps most cases, of any reliable ground truth. Unlike other areas of machine learning where data can be labeled by a human with a high degree of accuracy, medical diagnosis, as many of you know, is fraught with uncertainty. Indeed, some conditions, really important conditions, essentially exist as social constructs based on constellations of symptoms whose underlying causes are not fully known or agreed and change over time. So notwithstanding the excellent reports and guidelines that Wendy highlighted about ethical AI, these challenges are not merely superficial, I think, to be overcome by a particular ethical code. They're actually conceptual and fundamental. So I'm going to suggest as we progress with the development of AI, um, it's not just about ethical frameworks and conceptions of how we might address bias. We might actually wish to specifically invest in research and development to develop agreed frameworks that explore quantify and correct model performance across particular populations. And I think how that correction is applied is also a fundamentally humanistic question about what we want them to do about what is fair rather than a computable function. So my final observation, uh, moving on from that, concerns how we might make all of this happen to benefit every sector and every region of the UK. And, and clearly we have a, a, a wonderful roadmap that sets that out. It should be clear from what we've heard this evening and indeed my own remarks that no single organisation can undertake this alone. Rather, we need a complex blend of infrastructure, expertise and entrepreneurship, uh, an AI ecosystem. And I've heard that word used this evening already. Now, they don't happen by accident, I don't think, but they happen in particular locations in response to particular sets of incentives. It's the mixture of the right conditions, the right institutions, and the right connections that enable that transformation. I would observe one place where this happens again and again is in our cities. If you go back 200 years, we see the founding of my own university in London in 1826. Uh, lots of other European institutions were founded at the same time. It catalyzed a huge flowering of talent and activity in the natural and life sciences, which led to the interplay of technology and biology that continues to drive innovation to this day. Now, I'd observe every region of the UK contains at least one world leading comprehensive university, typically representing an anchor partner in its city for jobs and in innovation and deeply embedded in its local environment and culture. Addressing the issues of cross-disciplinary training, engagement of a broad range of sectors and disciplines is exactly what universities are specialized in over many centuries. And to apply that creative and catalytic power to work with commercial partners and other organizations across the UK is therefore a crucial way of delivering new AI technologies in industry and the public sector. So as AI moves from the browser to deployment among the people and planet we live on, establishing those partnerships could help ensure the relationship between people society and AI algorithms is both balanced and proportionate. So wrapping up, um, I've only had time to provide four reflections, provocations, depending on your position, but I hope they're useful. And um, the UK clearly has world leading strengths, as Wendy outlined, across all the major components of a world leading AI ecosystem. It's thus how now how we organize those strengths and incentivize them effectively to compete on a global stage that should concern us and I hope I've suggested some ways in which that could be done. Thank you. Well, thank you for those thoughts and provocations. And now we come to our fourth speaker, Professor Tom Rodden. Tom is Chief Scientific Advisor for uh, the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport. He's a professor of computing at the University of Nottingham. His research is highly interdisciplinary, brings together disciplines which tackle emerging human, social, ethical, and technical challenges as we increasingly use personal data and AI technologies. At Nottingham, he co-leads the Mixed Reality Lab, and he founded and co-directed the RCUK Horizon Digital Economy Research Initiative. Prior to joining DCMS, Tom was Deputy Executive Chair of EPSRC, where he was responsible for research strategy and was the UKRI lead both on AI and on e-infrastructure. So he was involved in several large scale initiatives spanning multiple disciplines right across UKRI. Thank you, Tom. Good evening, everyone. 
my goodness, it's an audience. <laughs> what I'm used to seeing, and this is, this is one for those of you of a certain age, whenever I've been doing conferences recently, is celebrity squares. Uh, <laughs> a, set of, a set of headshot images. I've, today I come into the department at DCMS predominantly just to tell people I was still tall because many of them had forgotten. So it's great to see you all face to face. And what I want to do today is do a little bit of a peroration and pull, pull us back to where, where I think the drivers of what we need to do to deliver the, the AI strategy. So Wendy did a fantastic job of outlining this journey for us. And she raised a number of points. I mean, she, you know, so we are, as a nation, we third in the number of publications third in field citations, and I believe there's some expertise in the audience that will confirm this for us, um, and we're third in setting up new companies in the AI space. So that's an incredible position for, and an incredible UK asset, uh, an intellectual asset for us to, to do and to exploit and use. So that journey through um, towards where we are now with the National AI Strategy highlights a number of things. I think we can say a lot of things about the AI strategy, but for me, I think I want to kind of stress two, two main things underpinning that strategy. One, we've got to double down on the UK investment. So 2.3 billion has been spent, but we've got to double down on that. We've got to continue. And in terms of the integrated review, we've got to shift to being a science superpower. And we've got to use AI, we've got to, use AI to become a science superpower and do that. So the other message, is that it's important, particularly important for AI, is that it is that it moves fast, it's advanced. We, as Wendy said, we can't take the foot off the grass. We've got to be innovative. We've got to sharpen and exploit the fact that many of the many of our academic and research bases are making major advances and transfer them as quickly as possible into success and value for the UK. Um, as quickly as possible. So when you strip away, those are the two key messages for me in both the AI Council roadmap and in the strategy itself. So why do you need a strategy at all? So I think some of it's we've talked about, about signaling, um, you know, signaling the strength of the UK, but also it's about managing the, that transition. I think Geraint did a very fine job of talking about that that transition is, is of AI from being a separate, separable thing to being part of society, to be integrated with us, to having the values that we have and to working with us. So, they, so future AI will need to be a partnership between people and the AI elements and, and we'll need to respect across them. We need to think about the UK strategic strength. So that third position in the world and the international position is really quite important. Um, a large amount of resource across the world has been spent on AI. We need to be selective and we need to be strategic and we need to think, think about how to do that. And we need to think about the externalities, the problems that we face um, in order to do that. And I think the final part I think is really quite important and I think it came across from all three of our speakers just how active and how diverse the activities currently are within any AI. Coordination is critical and focus is critical and the role of government to, to promote that coordination and to get those things working together is, is critical. So you could read through the whole document again, as I'm sure all of you have, but I, I think this, this diagram, which is often used by the Office of AI, I think I want to reflect on a, a, a couple of bits. It is no coincidence that diversity and public trust is at the centre of that diagram. I mean, that's a core principle that needs to be achieved in order for other parts to work through. So the kind of three pillars here of investing in the long term needs is critical and important in what we will do and need to do and managing that investment important. As Gernt mentioned, the, the AI ecosystems do not simply emerge. They need to be stimulated, they need to be thought of, and they need to be grown. And so investment for the long term in that AI, in that ecosystem is important. We've heard again, and I would absolutely endorse, um, particularly at this moment in time, the importance of fairness. 
Okay, um, if one thing the, COVID, the pandemic has done, it has, it has highlighted an amplified lack of fairness um, and diversity in the UK. So I think it's important that we are aware of, of that and that we ensure the benefits accrue to all and to all sectors and regions equally. And then finally, and again, um, Lord T um, Clement Stone's covered the real diverse set of challenges of governance in this space. What I want to do now is actually talk through not what will happen, but I think what the underlying drivers of the things we need to happen and the mechanisms that we need to ensure happen. So I think in terms of the ecosystem, I think we really need to promote diversity and skills at all levels. Um, Wendy spoke about this in terms of across the sectors, but diversity is really, really, really critical. And I think as Wendy has often say, said, said, whose AI do we want? Okay. Um, do you want the AI of people like me, kind of privileged white middle-class man, or do you want the AI of our society without having that diversity of views, diversity of perspectives and diversity of backgrounds? We aren't going to build a system. I think this again speaks to also a diversity of disciplines. Again, picking up on the um, picking up on the points that have already been made about the importance of the arts, humanities, and design and people. I think that is in terms of critical. It is worth remembering um, that many of these issues have their roots in philosophy and epistemology, not in not in maths. And we really need to think carefully about what we need here by AI and by intelligence. These are not simple words and they need unpacked. So I think that then speaks to the next point. Um, we, need to, we need AI research and innovation at the core of what's happening here, but it needs to be coordinated. It needs to be focused. It, we don't want it disparate and spread. We need to coordinate to get transdisciplinary and multidisciplinary approaches where different disciplines work together. We need it coordinated and focused so that it links with industry better. And it's important that we have a focused programme of that research and we, we work in a focused, coordinated way. One thing that's only been touched upon, but I think is, is something that, that is mentioned in the strategy, is we need the tools to do this. We need the kind of we need the actual heavy lifting tools to do this. So um, you know, earlier this week, Archer was was officially opened, but we need computational power, and we need computational power in the UK to do to do this in order to do in order, and that again needs coordinated with this AI mission. So so these things need brought together and thought. And again, I think the other asset that we need to think about, and again, is within the strategy is how we use data. So Wendy has mentioned data trusts and working through data trusts, but obviously government and government data sets and how we think through government data sets and the data of our citizens is really important, not only as a resource for AI and promoting AI, the AI community, but as a resource for improving government and, and using AI skills within it. So I think all those feel like a critical core part that need converged for the AI ecosystem. So, so moving to the next level of ensuring AI the AI benefits all sectors and region. I think we, I think one of the things that um, so I often characterise this of getting more people to know what R is. So we have a large number of industries in the UK that are data that they exploit and use data. We have a large number of uh, of initiatives thinking about digital uplifting and digital skills. The, the people within those SMEs and within that tail of sectors adopting modern new AI tools is a critically important driver in terms of ensuring those benefits happen. The access to that level of skills and level of expertise is going to be important, and um, particularly for companies who can't create their own AI department or hire in even their own AI expert. How does that happen and how do we do that? We need to increase our capabilities on trustworthy. You know, again, we have, we have members of members here who, who can talk much more eloquently about this, about trustworthiness, adaptability, transparency, um, 
a future where a future where you work with a, an artifact which is really smart but won't tell you why it's smart and just gives you an answer is not a future that will lend to collaborative working and the core of what we want to do is that collaborative working and working through these things so we need to increase our capabilities around that both both in terms of governance and the tools that drive that governance the technologies and self providing those tools and i think i think the, the the other role of government is to work across government and to identify those places where ai can make a difference the critical missions and car you know um, in climate change, carbon reduction, and the health of the nation, where AI and AI tools can be used and can be showcased. And we've seen some of those mentioned already tonight. Keep the wrong key. Finally, I want to talk about governance. And I think governance is a critical element of what needs to happen here. And um, much of this has already been mentioned. Just want to reflect a little bit more on this. I think AI standards are going to be critically important and I think they will form and, and shape the nature of AI going forward. And I think it's important that we, as a nation, place our values within those, that, that, those AI standards activities and provide genuine leadership on a, on a, in, in a global AI standard, standardization landscape. The challenge, though, is what to standardize what 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 do you standardize when as as one of our speakers mentioned definitionally ai is really challenging so i i i am refusing to answer the question if posed to me what is ai and i would challenge you all to answer that question and be able to do so but how do you then standardize something that is hard to define establishing and promoting good practices and we've seen a range of those initiatives um, presented already today. I think I'd reflect that those initiatives are from different perspectives, stakeholders and different positions and coordination across them and looking at them together will be, will be a challenge for us. So if you are building or using an AI system in a particular sector, doing a particular set of things, which of the six or seven different guidelines might you need to seek to use might well be a challenge that people could face. And I think coordination and thinking through those as in a coordinated manner will become increasingly important. And again, I think it's on government and the use of government to promote um, best practices and approaches in that governance and to showcase that governance and to kind of work through that. So move, so just want to pair right now and end. So I think this is a, this is a journey. We're still working through this. Um, the, um, small but beautifully formed office for AI um, who, are, who are seeking to address all the challenges of AI acro across government um, are, can, are working through their action plan, working, talking with government, industry and others and, and will seek advice and seek input in this. Coordination is important and the strategies like this are a good vehicle to promote coordination across government and across us all. But I think it needs to be identified and resourced and thought of in a coordinated way we need to think carefully about um, international cooperation again wendy raised this earlier um, and i think that will play out in a number of ways over over the next five to six years in terms of partnerships and i think when we think about international cooperation um, people often think of nation states but if you think of some of the large superpowers and technical AI superpowers that are here, that are international, they might not be nation states and we might well want to think again about the, that cooperation and relationship too. So I think the things to look forward, looking forward um, from the Office of AI, um, the AI Action Plan is due to be released and published soon and the Governance White Paper, um, which is committed to publishment is due for publication in the summer of this in summer of this year so those will be the next kind of steps and moving us forward on this in terms of the kind of government impetus so i think i'll just stop at that point and let you all ask questions of us all
you've heard, uh, this is the time for the audience to work hard as well. Um, do make the most of the expertise um, uh, in asking your questions. Uh, if you've got ideas and suggestions about what should be in the AI action plan or the governance white paper, this is your opportunity to suggest those. If you're speaking from the floor here, uh, please introduce yourself by name and with the organization uh, that you're involved with. Uh, please confine your remarks to one or two minutes. If you're participating online, uh, equally do ask, uh, put your questions in the Q&A on Zoom. Um, and not only can you ask questions, but you can support by upvoting other people's questions. But let's start with one or two from in the room. And I see a hand right at the back, please. On the actual title of this seminar, where you talk about the use of AI in industry and the public sector. So, homing in on that, um, I'd like to hear from people where they think Britain and the world has really made strides in this, given that AI, or if we just call it very clever software, has been around for quite a long time. Um, I mean, what one might, from my point of view, say that, well, it's done fantastically in weather forecasting, in website searches, and probably in biological modelling. It's been pretty abject in many other ways. The consumer facing um, call centres, for example, disease diagnosis, uh, to, to name but two. So I'd just be interested in your more expert points of view about uh, where there have been really good things happening and where there have been terrible things happening. Yeah, I'm able, to, I'm able to start by not answering that question in a bizarre sort of way. So I think, I think the refl this reflects to me the fact that AI is just embedded. So much of the activities of AI are, are, in, are, are hidden and happen with us. So, so I, I, if you want an example of massive success of AI, use your phone take a picture um it auto corrects the image it categorizes the image identifies his faces within it i remember when i was an undergraduate every one of those was a major phd topic in and of itself and yet they're in our pockets and i think um call centers and um, massively optimized in terms of uh, in terms of the use of ai and how ai are used use of you know and alter and change that as well actuarial work changed again so a lot of the everyday things around us are, have now got seem running as i kind of seem through them the tools of ai and the tools of techniques and i absolutely agree with you um with the use of the term ai and um, we just mean computing again don't we and we just mean smart computing so i think there's there's an awful lot of both data analysis and machine learning and the use of these AI techniques, which are just routinized and made invisible in use, which, mean, which means actually that success can often be hidden. Well, just quickly, because I think we want to get through a lot of questions. I think um, that uh, it's, it, what you've asked is a very broad question. AI has been around for a lot longer than any of us. But what's, what's here today, the revolution is driven by the compute power we have and the data all about the data that we've got access to um, that's what's caused this big tipping point you know i always talk about ai is coming in it's coming waves you know i remember when uh, I, i'm i'm even older than tom <laughs> no i'm a lot older than tom and i remember back in the day when face recognition was considered to be in the general case considered to be insoluble as a problem right that was what they talked about uh, in the labs I was in, in then. And, um, but, <laughs> so, um, and I, but the, so we've had waves where people have, and there was a, one of my predecessors, one of my predecessors, a predecessor of mine who produced an AI report for the government in the 70s said the UK will never fund AI or not again. I mean, that, it's famously on, there's a, a video of it on YouTube. And it was right at the time, probably, because it wasn't ready. But um, so in terms of it is it is it is uh, embedded 
uh, there will be new breakthroughs at the moment. It's machine learning, deep learning, and the applications of those and things Tom talked about. In the future, there will be new types of AI um, that we you know still as a PhD student somewhere in the world thinking about something that will be hugely revolutionary in 30, 40 years time. And it will probably be something to do with brain computer interfaces, or I don't know. But um, uh, there's this, um, I should shut up because there are amazing uh, successes. Um, you said it's not being used for curing disease, but uh, look at the way AI can be used to scan for tumors and things. It's do it much more quickly and efficiently, accurately than human beings. And uh, so much it can be used for. I should shut up. And so if I were to round it off just quickly by talking about UK strengths, which I think was in the, the original question, I, I guess what I pick out is foundational AI, see nature last week, um, probably fintech, ed, ed tech, uh, and some areas of health tech, uh, particularly drug discovery and logistics and those kind of areas, and some areas of di diagnostics. I think those, that would be my sort of start of a 10 in terms of UK strengths. And Tim, just over my shoulder, would you like to come in? <laughs> Thanks very much, John. Uh, much appreciated. I, I mean, I absolutely agree with Wendy that it, a lot of this is about the data. Um, but I always like to quote John McCarthy about the use of AI. Um, as soon as it works, no one calls it AI anymore. It's absolutely, you know, in our smartphones, but um, sometimes not in an altogether benign way. Uh, I mean, I've just spent five or six months on the joint committee on the uh, uh, joint select committee on the draft uh, online safety bill. And, uh, you know, there are many issues related to the way that algorithms uh, 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 amplify messages in an autonomous kind of a way. And it's the autonomy of AI, which I think is the difference between that and conventional software. Um, and of course, we're not always talking about autonomy. Um, and so I think we have to be quite careful, you know, what we think are the high risk areas and what we don't. Um, but I think there are some great areas where AI is really working. Uh, uh, I mean, Gerard talked about fintech and edtech. I mean, I, I'm a countryfile watcher myself, um, and I'm a big fan of, uh, of uh, uh, AI in agriculture. I think for the sustainable development goals, I think that's going to have a huge impact uh, ultimately. Was David Delpy in the middle, is that right? It was well, well spotted. Uh, just a quickie, I was going to, in fact, follow up Tom's point, um, and it links to to what we've just been speaking about. Uh, you mentioned that the whole field is is evolving incredibly rapidly, probably more rapidly than many other areas of, of science and technology. Um, but you then, in your talk, said there are lots of responsibilities for government. You refused to define what AI was. You also refused to define who is government uh, and who is going to be responsible for managing and governing and regulating what is a, a rapidly changing area. And regulation, as we know, always lags the t technology. Tom, do you want to start? Oh, Dave, I thought you were my friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, so let me let me unpack that a little bit more for you, for you David. So, so, so actually, I thought I, I think the standardization challenge it comes down to a definitional one, and and that and that AI is used as a catch-all term for many, many different things. And I think we need to get more precise than that. So I think that that that's what I meant entirely in that. And I think you're right about. And I think one thing for having a strategy is to start to make clearer where the boundaries of responsibility actually are. And as it currently stands, they are spread across government and they are, and part of the creation of the Office for AI was to start, start that consolidation. But if you look at, if you look at what's happened in the last five years of the last, of, um, uh, you know, five to five years to a decade within this space, there's been a proliferation of both of of academic government and joint bodies. Ada Lovelace, for example, would be one. Turing would be another. Um, there are multiple. Um, I I would. If there is a member of a UK HEI establishment who does not have a centre for AI, please feel free to raise your hand. Um, and so, 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 so that's what normally happens. You get that, and and I think then the consolidation 
then needs to occur. And I think part of what you want in a strategy is that coordination and, and to kind of push. And I think part of what you want the government, part of what you want the strategy to do is to encourage that, encourage that and answer the question as to whose responsibility is it both either horizontally or vertically in terms of regulation and where those boundaries are. And I think that's part of what the part of what the white paper should be doing and will be doing. Tom, you've had long association with uh, pressing the government. Is there anything you want to add on this one? Tim. Tim. Sorry, Tim. Yes, apologies. <laughs> it's all right. There, there could be well be two Toms. There can't be enough, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> apologies. Um, but I, I absolutely uh, agree that we need to identify, you know, where the responsibility for governance lies. And I don't think the Office for AI is set up to do that. I don't think the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation is set up to do that. I think you have to find the appropriate regulator in all of this if you're going to have a um, an effective set of recommendations in the AI governance white paper. And I noticed that Tom slipped in summer this year as opposed to spring, um, uh, which I think we were originally promised, but it, it may be it's a late spring, Tom, who knows? Um, uh, but I, I think that what we need to think about is, first of all, in government, in public sector use of algorithms and AI, uh, what is the appropriate governance mechanism? Because at the moment, it's a bit of a, uh, a free range, quite frankly. I mean, we have this, the, the CDDO within the Cabinet Office, um, uh, but they don't really have the role of uh, making sure that the uh, use of algorithms and AI in government are uh, ethically uh, uh, applied and developed. Um, and then by the same token, out there in the private sector, in terms of what we will no doubt be setting up uh, uh, in terms of a risk as assessment audit uh, requirement, um, you know, which is going to be the regulator? There's some very hard decisions to be made. Um, is the poor old new uh, uh, information commissioner uh, going to be the one that uh, 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 has the parcel eventually? Um, well, I suspect that the ICO is probably the one best set up for this um, because I can't see most of the other regulators um, uh, fitting this role very easily. Do you want to move on? I have nothing to add. Right. I think we should get some people from the audience because there was a lot of reaction yeah. to that. Well, that's fine. Okay, just near the front here. Yep. Sheila Bird, formerly uh, programme leader at Medical Research Council, Inspire Statistics Unit, and and so a biostatistician. So I believe in data by design. So a biostatistician. So I believe in data by design, and that in order to earn public trust, one must be trustworthy, and I would also make the point that medical data are different. They are different because when I consent to my doctor or to the nurse to take a biological sample or to have an image taken, I do not know at the point of my consent what that will tell about me. It is quite different from my answering a question when I can choose to lie. I cannot choose to lie about the result of a biological test for which I have given consent. And so respect medical data. Thank you. Yeah, fully agree. And I think it's worth thinking a little bit about the implications of that for, say, some of the things Tom talked about in terms of provision of compute and provision of data. Because um, if, for example, we are going to treat medical data as I think is entirely appropriate as sensitive and personal data, then we might like to think not just about where the data is, but where the compute is that's going to be applied to that data. Because frankly, it's not necessarily going to be on Archer or any general purpose system. It may well have to be on specialized systems and trusted research environments that live in particular locations associated with our healthcare system. And so there are domain specific, if we want to be good at healthcare, that I think are not just about data, but actually about compute. Um, I, I, there's two things I want to say. One is um, that I think Tim's point earlier was about how, how is, it's not just 
what we regulate, but how these, this is such a big topic. It is not, there is not one, one regulator that I don't, it's going to be a mix of things. And it, that's the hard thing. It's like, um, you know, it's a, it's a soup of things and it's a hard thing to work out what, which organization regulates which bit. Medics, I, medical, I agree, is hugely important. But the thing, I, the other thing I wanted to add is that we're going to, we're about to hit a major new revolution on how the internet works. Web 3.0 is going to be big somehow or other. I wish I knew how. Uh, I used to, Web 3.0 used to be what people like me and Tim and Nigel Shabbat call the semantic web. Actually, this is a new, this is a, it's all, uh, it's all um, bit, um, blockchain, it's all uh, metaverse, it's, and uh, why I say this in the respect of medical data, Web, Web 3.0, if it's anything, is about giving you back control over your data. There are a lot of organisations trying to design architectures that the world will pick up about that decentralises data control. And this, your point about medical data is central to how, how, you, how are we going to manage this? In, uh, I could, I could, yeah, we should have a whole, you should have a whole meeting on it, Gavin. Yeah, I mean, I would have one statement <laughs> with some NFTs as well. Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> one Cheap. statement. In, <laughs> in the, I absolutely agree with you. Um, I would flag that um, we probably need to revisit the current concepts in and around consent, full stop, um, where the transactional moments for the giving of consent might not be as easy to spot, whether that relationship, and Anara O'Neill has written quite extensively on the myth of informed consent in, 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 the, in, the, bio, in, in, in the medical sense. And I think that, that we're not necessarily in the best possible place as to how those have moved into terms and conditions um, and signing off and giving consent on things which are more complex and Beowulf and longer than Othello in 1.2 seconds average across the UK. So, so I think there's a range of, of lessons as to what consent might be more broadly outside the medical domain as well, with inferred data particularly. Tom, I, I think that's right, but, but we shouldn't over-egg it, I think, in the medical domain. So it's, it's routine, for example, for people to give consent to very complex scanning technologies uh, that they're unable to describe or explain how the images are yeah. produced that are used in, in their diagnosis. So we do have worked examples. I, I mean, I totally agree in the longer term, but I think so in the shorter term, we have quite a lot of regulatory frameworks. Too, too long a debate for this, but, but I agree. And I think Anara and Neil gives, gives a good starting point for how we'd actually think of consent as a trust relationship yes. rather yes. than rather than a transactional relationship and i think we but I, we could go on okay do you guys I, want I, to leave so we'll do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me kind of come in with, with a couple of sentences um i mean i entirely agree and health data is treated as special and that's exactly why with the current health bill going through parliament health and care bill going through parliament there's so much debate about uh, NHS digi yeah, digital um, uh, being abolished and the data uh, haven, uh, 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 the hub uh, uh, responsibility being transferred to NHS England because it won't be held separately anymore. And that is a problem. And I, I think Wendy is absolutely right. We need much more work on things like uh, hubs of all things, the solid uh, 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 initiative of Tim Berners-Lee of data trusts, and we haven't put and enough. Was, um, we haven't put enough behind that. So, how do you see um, the cooperation with them? What, I mean, what sort of fruitful collaboration we can think in that space? I think there's a real big set of discussions to unpack there. I mean, with the GAFAM companies generally. Um, so, 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 and 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 I think there's there's a number of things. Then I think I'd I'd probably. I'd probably look historically to previous industrial revolutions and the growth of very large companies and that and that you you will have a phase of 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 kind of free for all unregulated and then the need for regulation um, and need for governance emerges and I think we're we're in that part of the journey and and I think there's it's it, it's still playing out in a number of ways and obviously you know, there's a number of our departments involved in a number of the 
initiatives in the UK. The UK is seeking to regulate um, in order to make the UK um, ecosystem both uh, both both safe, secure, and regulated, but also pr promoting prosperity and innovation and, and striking a balance there between them. And I think that I think the, there's a bit of a debate. I think also as to whether these companies ultimately, as other historical companies have had to do in the past, feel external regulation becomes much more useful for them um, than internal industri industry driven regulation. And all of that, I think, is 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 an ongoing live set of discussions which are political and policy driven rather than scientific but they but they are they will be interested in shaping our ecosystem going forward Jim, did i say that you wanted to come in um i didn't hear the question in full because i was still talking but <laughs> uh, sadly <laughs> but we um, muted you <laughs> <laughs> exactly it happens to me all the time john um, uh, but I, I would say that I think GPAY, uh, the Global Partnership on AI, is a very useful uh, uh, form of collaboration. But it's got to it's got to deliver concrete results. I mean, you know, we they've they produced very uh, useful papers on uh, things like uh, AI and employment and so on. Um, but what we really need to do is to get to grips with standards, things like uh, risk assessment and audit and, it, uh, um, and so on, so that uh, we bring the US particularly into the fold, um, because that's what GPAY should be all about. Um, uh, and uh, it, it, so far, it hasn't really um, delivered, in a sense, a governance product. Thank you. Um those here will have more opportunities uh, after this. I'm going to focus on a couple of skills questions from online. And the first one says, according to the Capital Economics Report on AI activity in UK businesses for DCMS, lack of skills is a major factor. We could be facing a shortage of AI skills from 50,000 to 100,000 in the next five years. However, do we address that gap? Wendy, well, we start. started. I mean, that, we recognise this back in the. It's what everyone talks about. Every country is after these skills, and I hope I explained. I won't go over again the things that we've been doing to try and um, increase the number of people working in this sector. And I want to stress that whilst we need lots of machine learning programmers, we need lots of people from different disciplines coming into AI and these master's AI conversion courses are really important and I hope just we can spread that to other sectors not just at the at the postgraduate level but um, and, and uh, as this is why we have to keep our, our foot on the gas right we we we, we need um, more people in this area and it's uh, yeah I, 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 what else can I say <laughs> okay so I'd agree that I think the government has been um, extremely far sighted in terms of funding quite a lot of these things through UKRI and other bodies. So that's good. Um, can we do more? Yes, there is always um, a, a blank check awaiting the answer to that particular question. I, I guess the point I make, I make two points. One is, I think it's not just about people transitioning into AI, however important that is. It is also about cross disciplinary training where people stay exactly where they are and interact with those practitioners yeah. and I think we need to pay more attention to that because we don't have enough and we haven't thought enough and why that's important is the second reason I think that that there are going to be presumably some areas of competitive advantage for our economy in particular sectors and that might be where we focus that particular cross-disciplinary training to the extent we want to have a policy and a direction for that yeah. and so thinking about those use cases and where you get them and what sort of cross-disciplinary interactions you need might, might be a productive way of thinking. I'm going to add one thing. I know you haven't, but it's going to say we haven't got time. But when we started writing the review in 2017, Jerome and I, the rhetoric was all about how everyone's going to lose their jobs to AI. Right? That has so changed. It's like we need lots of people. We, your country needs you, right? And all of you can be involved in AI. It, you, you know, you don't have to be anything special. Um, you need the right training, the right careers advice, the right whatever. But the rhetoric has changed in the last four or five years dramatically around that. So the next question online from Keith Peters is exactly in that area. Yes, asking an online question, yes. <laughs> there are those who believe that AI will cause massive changes to the existing workforce, including professions hitherto immune to scientific advances. 
What, what do we do about that? It's immune. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think I, what about what I would probably say in picking up on, on both points have already been made is that um, AI industries will establish new value value propositions and new supply chains with a host of skills at all levels, all working together to do the product from you know and and from apprentice level um, from apprentice level up to advanced PhDs and I think it's important we have skills in all those levels and I think what we won't see what we will see is a reconfiguration of professions and a reconfiguration of intellectual work in some of the professions that were hitherto <laughs> immune um, I, I, but in doing so it will it, it will it will be like absorbing most technological changes the professions will alter and amend in the but practices. you're not going to risk on it by telling us which ones oh i think lawyers <laughs> <laughs> I, I think i think i think there i think i think there's a really nice article um published um which which actually uses machine learning to give you a an estimate of when and at what proportion you will be automated um, I'll provide you I'll provide you the detailed citation to it but it's already been done by a machine learning uh, exercise um, speaking, so lawyers, speaking lawyers. as a lawyer I deep, deeply resent that uh, I, I deeply resent that comment uh, Tom um, politicians oh, mm. <laughs> uh, no no as, uh, speaking as a lawyer um, it, I don't think politicians <laughs> I don't think politicians are going to be replaced, um, but I do think that actually it's going to change the tasks uh, within the law um, so that all the a lot of the, if you like, the research uh, and the analysis uh, uh, will be done by AI and lawyers uh, will have a, a wonderful life and they will continue to advise you in the wise way that they do at the moment. Yes. Word right. More. Next online question, different entirely. How, what are what should we think next in the AI strategy about the defence aspects, especially when considering that our adversaries uh, may hold themselves to different standards to the to to this country? Oh. Nice easy question. <laughs> well. Such a good question, but I haven't seen the defence strategy. No one can see it. It's too no. top secret. Um, so, uh, oh. There must be something that can be said. Oh, Tim, what, Tim. What, what? Tim wants to come in, by the way. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. Sorry, Tom. Um, you, you go first, Tim. Uh, okay. Um, I mean, there is a uh, quite a big debate currently about this. We haven't seen the defence AI strategy uh, yet, um, but it, the, our MOD is certainly not very keen on... Uh, arms limitation in the uh, lethal autonomous weapons uh, area. Um, uh, but I think ultimately, rather like uh, nuclear proliferation, we're going to have to have some international treaty that covers this. Um, but at the moment, uh, our government denies that it has uh, any autonomous weapons effectively. So um, we're, uh, you know, we're at the point where the people are, are in denial um, and therefore they don't believe that we need to be negotiating uh, uh, for the limitation of these arms. But I think that point is coming and a lot of people uh, uh, agree with me that, that we do need to move much faster towards some kind of international treaty. I also want to just add that, I mean, the whole cyber warfare piece is really important here because... So, I mean, I agree entirely. Um, I mean, I think moving beyond autonomous weapons and the use of AI within those autonomous weapons I think the AI alters and changes um, what our perceptions and views of cybersecurity may be um, in, in multiple ways, both securing AI, the data associated with AI, um, but uh, and the use of AI as a tool within cyber within within both both in terms of cyber defence and and in terms of um, cyber capabilities generally. And I think it's. I think that that's a space where where lots of lots of discussion is underway, and and we need to think carefully just exactly where those boundaries lie. And I think what it means to secure AI, which is at its most foundational and intellectual endeavour, so how you secure an AI algorithm becomes really quite challenging. I, I think that's 
there's a conceptual problem here which we have to grapple with, which is what now constitutes dual use technology. Yeah. Yes. So I think that that's that's fairly straightforward when it comes to conventional arms, nuclear and biological weapons and things like that. But of course, it's now starting to get blurred. When is an algorithm a dual use thing? Um, and I don't think we've done that conceptual work to think about that and define that, which would then enable us to take forward that kind of a conversation. And I would suggest that that's something we might want to focus on. And um, that debate is happening in places. Um, so, for example, both myself and Sarah, um, as part of um, within EPSRC, are thinking about the response of UKI and research councils to trusted research and how we think about trusted research in order to get a move us on. But it is a new territory, I think, for our academic community to think about dual use and to think about what the future consequences are for, for this part of the community, I think. Yeah, I think quite I think people have been thinking about it quite seriously yeah. for, for for longer than you might think if you if you believe what you read in the newspapers, uh, which I don't. Um, <laughs> okay, always. time for the next one. This has got the most votes from our online uh, participants. How do we use uh, AI to address the climate change crisis head on? With difficulty and lots of opportunity. So I think the difficulty here is if the future is Web 3.0, um, and blockchain that takes up an awful lot of compute. So there's a there's a difficulty here in terms of energy usage, which is obvious and very stark to anyone who uses data centers. Um, so that's the sort of threat, I think. Um, the opportunity is there are many, many, many uses of algorithms. So for example, in my own institution, we've got a spin out that's uh, looking at um, essentially helping organizations decarbonize their supply chain and other things like that, Carbon Ray, which uses hey presto AI to help do that. Um, there are lots of other potential um, applications. I think uh, Tim mentioned um, farming, um, but biodiversity is something as a life scientist I'd pick up in terms of both monitoring and understanding the effects of climate crisis on biodiversity. Lots of applications there. And there are endless papers, so there's a very good review in the literature of all the ways in which AI might assist with techno, te uh, sustainability. Sorry, so back to you. So I would only commend people to look at and read the Royal Society's report on computing for the future of the planet, which which talks about the both the promise and threat, um, and how to manage that. And the you know uh, and the, there's a complex set of um, complex set of various drivers at play here. Um, that, that we need to be careful about in terms of presenting any computing as a solution only to this. Um, so I think it, you know, it's worth, worth looking through that report, which I think covers the, that ground incredibly well, including AI within it. Tim, do come in. Uh, thank you, John. I, I mean, I do think there is potential, uh, and I agree with, with, with Geraint, um, but I, I, I think that the downside it has to be cleared up as well. And anybody who's um, uh, read the first chapter of Kate Crawford's AI Atlas, uh, where she starts off really with the environmental impact of artificial intelligence, um, I think would be, you know, thinking, well, for heaven's sake, we've got to sort out the incredible energy use of data centers, uh, there's the lithium mining and so on. So I think I'm very optimistic about AI being able to deliver the sustainable development goals, for instance, um, uh, but uh, we've got to clear up the downside as well. Thank you. One more from the hall. Yes, right over there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Henry Eglis Rotus. So I work for a scale up um, in, here in London using semantic web knowledge graphs for uh, deep learning purposes. Anyway, um, I'm, uh, I'm really interested. Uh, it strikes me um, uh, on a daily basis. I, I'm, a, I'm a knowledge graph engineer. I work with product managers, I work with software engineers, machine learning engineers. We're all making ethical decisions on the ground every day. Um, and it strikes me looking at the the list here, there aren't that many people from organizations like the one I'm working for. Um, and does that concern you basically? 
Wendy? Can I, well, I'll take that. It's great to meet you. Thank you. Um, so uh, uh, I think that um, we we're not going to solve this overnight. It's a very important point you make because we need to provide advice frameworks um, that for, for how companies like yours should operate, what best practices. Um, and I do think over time, I be, I'm becoming convinced, it's the first time I've said it in public, but I'm becoming convinced that we need, are going to need some sort of um, professional AI uh, accreditation, charteredness, something that perhaps charter is the wrong word, but something that says, I have been on courses, I know what this means, I have some understanding of what I should be doing here, what my responsibilities are, and that um, you know you know who to go to, who is, um, is accredited to work and be, give advice in this area. Um, and I'm becoming convinced that we really need to start talking about that now. We haven't really up until now. I mean, the BCS, I was president once, they do a chartered IT professional, as ch and um, you know, they could be, they definitely could be part of this conversation, but I'm, uh, it's broader than just the technology. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm keen to get that sort of conversation going, actually, with anyone that's interested in talking about it. I'd say I'm concerned, and it's actually a feature of my research and my other job at Nottingham. Um, I, I think that the, design approaches, design techniques, and design methodologies need um, augmented with an ethical challenge, ethical framework on it. And so some of the work we've been looking at doing specifically has been doing things like ideation cards and other techniques that actually make it part of your everyday practice. The, the dilemma you face is the a tyranny of the immediate displacing the important um, and that and that you want to develop you you quite rightly developing products working through products and um, if if we make it that you need to understand the large amounts of documentation and regulation in order to be able to figure out whether you're doing as legal or ethical then there's a problem and I think I think part of what we need to do is is package the things for the everyday engineer who's actually building these systems and I think it is part of what uh, is part of what the skills agenda uh, we'll be looking at and doing in terms of making those things much more accessible, as well as to educators and, and other, it, you know, ethics doesn't happen in the abstract, it's a everyday decision and part of what people do, and I think it's important we do scale it up. And I think it's going to become even more, I entirely agree with that, but I think it's going to become even more important when we start thinking about an AI audit function, because, you know, one can envisage a kind of ethical Hippocratic oath for AI developers. Some people have suggested that, but when it comes to being able to trust the people who are gonna do the audit and the impact assessments and so on, uh, then that kind of uh, accreditation, I think is gonna become even more important. And uh, uh, we don't have anything like that yet. Let's work on it together, Tim. <laughs> Let's do that. Uh, we've got to uh, drinks time, you've earned a drink. <laughs> Um, so um, thank you all for your active participation in this first part. Do keep thinking of questions, those of you here for the second part. Um, so we, uh, a particular thanks to uh, Tim Clement Jones for his participation. Um, uh, we will, uh, when Gavin rings his bell, you are all immediately to stop drinking and immediately go downstairs. Um, and um, and we will have a second session of questions. So thank you all very much. <laughs>